And um, the rest of the story is about Joseph uh, resisting that temptation and then being lied about and then finally be, being put in prison because he, um, he would not back down in, uh, on his integrity. And um, in the, you know, we already, we already dealt with that part of the subject and, and the whole issue of lust and, and uh, um, temptation and, and that kind of thing. What I wanted to talk about tonight was uh, the whole issue of having a clean heart in the area of, of integrity specifically. Um, one of the things that you see all through Joseph's life is that he was a guy who was diligent to do the things that he was supposed to be doing. So when he's a kid um, in his dad's household, um, he is the second youngest of 12 kids, or of 12 boys. Actually, he's the second young, youngest of 13 kids because uh, Dinah was uh, in the household too. And so he's um, uh, second from the youngest, and basically what his father does is he puts him in charge of all the other brothers, which is probably a mistake on his father's part because all the other brothers are older and they don't, you know, they didn't appreciate the fact that their, their kid brother Joseph was the one that dad was sending to check up on them. And that, kind of, and, and that kind of situation. And so Joseph gets in all kinds of problems with his brothers because his brothers are jealous of him um, because um, it's kind of out of whack as far as an authority structure goes. But the reason that Joseph was put in that position is because of the, the same thing that you see in this passage right here. The guy was a trustworthy man and he would do what his father said and he had his father's interest in mind and not just his own. And so his father put him in a place of authority, gave him the coat of many colors and all that kind of stuff, right? And then what happens is, uh, again, we already dealt with this, but he gets sold into slavery. And when he gets sold into slavery, what the dude does is he blooms where he's planted. And so he's in Potiphar's house, and what he does is he became, becomes the best servant in the house. He's a servant, and so he's the best. And what Potiphar um, sees in the guy is that he's obviously intelligent and he is obviously a guy who can handle authority and he is a guy who is going to care about Potiphar's stuff before he cares about himself. And so Joseph excels in Potiphar's house and Potiphar puts him in charge of everything. Now obviously that didn't work out totally well for him because then he got noticed by Potiphar's wife and you have that, that whole thing and I'm not going to go over that again. But in the next chapter what happens is Joseph's in prison now. So Potiphar's wife scream, you know, cries rape, and Potiphar has to do something with Joseph. Obviously, Potiphar didn't believe that Joseph raped his wife because if he had, he would have had Joseph killed. He wouldn't have put him in prison. And there's a good chance because Potiphar was the captain of the guard that Potiphar also had oversight over the prison too. And so Potiphar puts Joseph in prison as basically a way out of the situation that saves face for him and keeps him from having to divorce his wife or do whatever with his wife. And probably there's a political marriage that's going on there too. So there's all this stuff in the, you know, kind of in the backstory that's going on. And Joseph's in the middle of it through no fault of his own. So he goes to prison and guess what he becomes? The best prisoner in the prison. And so then what happens is Joseph gets in charge of everything in the prison now. And nothing's happening without Joseph, you know, doing this stuff in the prison. It's just crazy stuff. And then what happens is a couple of guys come into the prison because um, there had been a uh, dust up in the government. And basically there was uh, a, uh, probably an assassination attempt on the Pharaoh. And two guys are pointed out as being part of that plot. And one was the guy, one was the guy who was a cup holder. He's the guy who would taste the food or taste the, the drink of the Pharaoh before the Pharaoh ate. And the other one was the baker. And so he's the cook. So those two guys get implicated in the, in the thing. They come into the prison. They have a dream. Joseph interprets the dream. And he says to one, you know, in three days, Pharaoh's going to lift you up. He's going to let you out of here. And the other guys are encouraging the whole thing. And, and Joseph says in three days, uh, Pharaoh's going to lift your head off your body and you're going to die. And uh, the guy who ends up going back to Pharaoh, Joseph says, remember me when you go back to Pharaoh. And what happens is he doesn't. And so for two more years, Joseph's in prison. But when the Pharaoh has a dream, this dude, um, the, uh, the guy that was in prison, remembers Joseph and the fact that he could interpret dreams. And so he tells the Pharaoh, I knew a guy in prison. 
I've heard that before. I've had friends like that. I knew a guy in prison that, you know, but I knew a guy in prison. And so he tells him about Joseph and then Joseph goes out and serves Pharaoh and he does it unselfishly and without regard for his own. And he does it in a way that honors the Pharaoh and honors his position. And so guess what happens with Joseph again? And what happens is he gets lifted up in the Pharaoh's government and he literally becomes the second in charge of all of Egypt. And it's all because he's a man of integrity. It's all because he's a guy who will do the right thing no matter where he's at. And God blesses that. Now, ultimately, what ends up happening at the end of the story, and uh, you can tell I'm kind of excited about this. I love Joseph. There's a couple guys in the Old Testament that I love a lot. Joseph was one of them, and Jonathan is another. You know, usually you're, you're, you're looking at David. But Jonathan was a guy that, you know, he was in a bad position um, in between his father and his best friend. And he was an honorable guy all the way to the end. And even though his father was a messed up unit, he ended up dying for him, protecting him and stuff. Just, you know, I just love that guy. And so you have, uh, but you have, again have the same thing with Joseph. And the guy's just blooming where, he plant, where, where God planted him. And God used him to save the people of Israel save his whole family in the midst of a famine, bring them down to Egypt where God grew a nation out of these people. And so in the end, his brothers are repenting and um, actually they repent a couple of times. They repent before their father dies and then when their father dies, they're worried that Joseph's gonna come back after him because of all the stuff that, he, that they'd done to him. And Joseph said, you don't, need to, you don't need to worry about this. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so Joseph was a guy who could see that even though he had been pl placed in the middle of a situation where bad things had happened to him, you know, I mean, you go through Joseph's life and, and, and the whole thing runs the gamut. His, his brothers want to kill him. They want to sell him into slavery. Some, some lady wants to um, commit, a, commit adultery with him and she ends up getting him thrown in prison. And, you know, you've got all this awful stuff that's going on in Joseph's life. And what Joseph sees is the hand of God at the end. He's probably, when he's in the midst of it, he's probably going, God, what are you doing? And he's just hanging on. But at the end, he sees the hand of God in the whole thing, and he realizes that what God was doing was making one man uncomfortable so he could save hundreds. And that's, that's the end of the story. And then finally, actually, he ends up saving millions because God made the nation of Israel when they went down to Egypt. So that's an overview of Joseph's life. But what I wanted to uh, key in on here is this whole thing with having uh, just integrity in your relationships with the people around you. And the best place I know to go to that is in Psalm 15. You know, um, if, if, I, if I wanted to, to do a, um, like a study on integrity all through the, you know how many verses we'd be talking about? We'd be dealing with half of Proverbs. Um, we'd probably be dealing with a quarter of the Psalms. And, you know, there's all, all these passages that talk about it. But Psalm 15 is one of my favorites because it gives an overview of what a guy who, uh, a, a person who's going to serve the Lord is supposed to look like. And he, uh, David, um, kind of covers the gamut as far as interpersonal relationships and then business relationships. And so it's a good thing. And so Psalm 15 is all about qualifications for dwelling with God. Let's read it. It says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And what's that mean? The tabernacle of God, um, during the time of David, the temple hadn't been built. And so the tabernacle of God was the same tabernacle that went through the wilderness. It was, a, it was the dwelling place of God. Um, it was the tent where uh, the Jews went and met with God. And when it talks about dwelling in the tabernacle or dwelling in the holy hill, um, the the holy hill would be the place where the tabernacle was put. It's the idea of having a relationship with God where you hang with him, where you have a, have a real live relationship with God and he has a relationship with you and you're accepted and everything is good between you and him. Now, um, we're Christians and so we have a relationship with God that's not based on any of the works that we see in here. Our relationship with God is based on the fact that Jesus came and he died in our place and he made us right before God, right? But there are things that separate you from God, even as a Christian. And the Bible says um, in, uh, in the book of Isaiah, um, it's not that I can't hear you. 
It's not that my arm's not uh, um, that my arm's short and I can't reach you. It's your sin that's separated between you and me. And so even though we may not be in a position where if we fall short in some area, um, we don't have a relationship with God anymore, what happens is um, we offend him. And there's a distance. And you can offend people that love you. And one of, one of the things that um, I strive to do when I, when I look at my relationship with God is to recognize that who, you know, what I'm dealing with is not, is, is, is not some cosmic unit out in space someplace. What I'm dealing with is a person. And he is someone who absolutely loves me. You know, that's, I mean, you, you can find verse after verse on that. But he's a person. And I have to have a relationship with him where it's mutual and where it's beneficial. Um, it's always going to be beneficial from God's point of view towards me. But I want to be beneficial to him. And that's the way that a relationship is supposed to go. The reason my wife likes me is because I do things for her. I do, I do the things that a husband is supposed to do. I treat her in the way that a husband's supposed to treat her. Not always. Sometimes I pour water on her head. You know, were you guys here this morning? <laughs> that was a long time ago. Only did it once. Never did it again. <laughs> but um, what, what happens is I have a relationship with her where I spend time with her and I talk with her and, you know, there's a back and forth that goes on. And what I try not to do is strain that relationship because I like her. You know, obviously I love her, but I'm talking about liking her too. And I like hanging out with her and stuff. Well, it's the same thing with God. I like God. I like hanging out with him. I want him to be pleased with me and I want to be pleasing to him. And so when you look at, at um, passages like this, the, the idea behind it isn't that um, if you fall short in this, that you've lost your salvation or something. You don't lose your salvation. Salvation is not a set of keys. I lose my keys all the time. Salvation is not a set of keys. You can't lose it. You could walk away from it, Hebrews says, but you can't lose it. So you're not doing this by accident type of thing. And so when you're, when you're looking at passages like this, these are things that are offensive to people. And they're offensive to God too. And so if I'm in a position where I'm doing these things, then what needs to happen is I need to, to apologize and ask God to forgive me and then try to turn away from those things and have a right kind of relationship. It's just like that with any friend that you have. If you've done something that's offensive to them, then what you do is you try to apologize. You try to make the thing right, and then you move on with your relationship. And, you know, again, sometimes you do that, and it doesn't work really well, and people, people you know, just go on with their stuff. That never happens with God. You apologize to God, God's always going to forgive you he, because he wants to hang with you. Some people don't. Okay, in any case, he says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, who may dwell in your, whole, in your holy hill, and then he basically gives an overview here of what a person like that looks like. And, in, and it's in verse 2 right there. It says, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness. Now, an upright walk, the word, the word upright means to be complete, to be sincere. And so that's a, that's a, that's a pretty easy thing. You know, um, when, you're, when you're talking about walking with God, that picture is always used in scripture as far as having a relationship with God. It's like two people walking down the road. You know, um, you don't walk down the road with people that you don't like, unless you're in the military. <laughs> you don't walk down the road with people that you don't like. If you see two, two people walking down a street or you see, see two people walking down, down a sidewalk, um, walking in the mall together, what you know immediately is that those two people are friends. That's what you know immediately, right? And so the, the situation that you have with, with a relationship with God, uh, um, uh, if you're going to have a walk with him, then that walk needs to be sincere. It needs to be for real. And there's no reason to go any other direction than that with, with your relationship with God. Because if you're not walking in sincerity, if there's not a real heartfelt desire for God and a heartfelt desire to do the things that he wants, you don't have a walk with God in the first place. What you have a walk with is church or religion or something like that. And what we want is our walk to be with God, right? And so it means to be upright and sincere. And again, a walk is a, is a, is a picture of life and conduct. 
Then the next thing that he talks about there is that you need to be a person who works righteousness. He who walks with sincerity or truth and he who works righteousness. That word righteousness comes from a word that means straight. And so the things that I do need to be things that are straight, not crooked. They need to be straight, not sneaky. They need to be straight. They need to just be straightforward. And so again, one of the things that you see over and over in scripture is that when you're um, talking about the issue of integrity, basically what, what you see in a man, what you see in a woman when they say something needs to be the same thing that's on the inside of them. And a lot of times what we have a, have a tendency to do is to change our verbiage, to change our actions depending on the people that we're with so that we can impress them. Now, let me, let me back up there a little bit and let you know that I will change my verbiage and I will change my actions depending on who I'm with so that I can reach them, but I don't change it so that I can trick them into having you know a great time with me. So for example, here I am standing in a button-down shirt, Levi's, and um, what do we call these? Flip-flops. I used to, we used to call them thongs uh, back when I was a kid, and my kids just have a fit anytime I say that. So the flip-flops. So that's what, uh, here I am, the pastor of Calvary Chapel, standing in this. If I get invited to another church to speak, whether it's a Calvary or not, especially if it's like a Baptist church, I've been invited to other churches to speak, I would never ever wear this and if I was invited to a Baptist church most likely I'd 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 whip out my suit and I would put that on because I don't want to automatically offend people just by standing in front of them in my regular clothing this is fine here this is us but it's not something that I would do in front of anybody and I'm not doing that so that I can trick them I'm doing that so that I can be polite to them and it's the same the same way uh, uh, the same thing in Uh, with people that I speak to. It's not the idea of of I need to speak my mind on every issue in the way that I normally speak at every time. Um, What I need to do is I need to be for real about the things that I'm saying, but I can adjust that to the audience. So here I am speaking to a bunch of adults. I would never speak like this to a group of high school kids, if that's all that was here. I would never speak like this for sure to a group of, of, of junior high kids or elementary school kids. I would change the way that I speak. Message wouldn't change, my heart wouldn't change, but the way that I speak would change. Follow me? And so it's not, it's not a one size fits, fits all cookie cutter type of thing, but what needs to happen is the things that are coming from you need to be things that are straight, things that are for real, things are, that are um, works of integrity. Um, basically. And so that's the overview of the thing. And then he goes into um, specific issues and he starts talking about things that will trip you up in your integrity and cause you to have problems with other people. And the first thing that he speaks about in the passage is, again, in verse 2, at the end end of verse 2, it says, and speaks the truth in his heart. Speaks the truth in his heart. And that's the idea of having inward truth. So when you're, when you're talking about somebody who's walking in integrity, what you have is a guy who has a heart in which there's nothing false. Now, obviously, there is only one person who's ever lived up to that, right? That's Jesus. And so I, um, I am in situations in my life where God is constantly talking to me. Well, not constantly, but all the time. Things come up where, where I may think to do one thing or do another thing, and maybe I'm fudging something, and God goes, fake, fake. You know, I've, I've told you the story of uh, my wife asking me if I have an emotion. You know, you know, I think I told that story not too long ago. Basically, um, what happened was she, she, she asked me to tell me some deep thing inside my heart You know, it's like, you never talk to me about your emotions. You never talk to me about what's going on deep inside of you and that kind of thing. And I'm sitting there at the moment when she's saying it, and I feel bad for her because she wants some connection with me, and I don't have anything. And so what I did was I tried to make up an emotion for her. And immediately what God did was he goes, fake, don't do that. And I, and I just went, you know what, Bobby, this is what you got. I thought, this is all I've got right here. I'm, I, you know, most times I'm not emotional. And it's not that I can't be that way. If my dog dies, way emotional. If my horse dies, way emotional. 
You know, all things like that are going on. Bad things are happening with my kids, even bad things happening to my wife. I get way emotional on things. But for the most part, going through my life, I'm not a touchy-feely guy. And so pretty much, that's what I am. And so, you know, I don't get to fake it. I don't get to pretend. And um, uh, that's, that's the idea behind this whole thing of speaks the truth in his heart. He's a man of truth, a woman of truth. There's nothing false. There's no pretense. There's no speaking one thing and meaning another. And that, again, is one of those things that um, sometimes people fall into. Now, you know, um, I'm, you know, when we're going through and looking at this stuff, one of the things that I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about this is that there are things that people fall into that some, some people are bent towards. And some people are not. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to be talking about backbiting. Look at verse 3. It says, he who does not backbite with his tongue. And if you don't know what that means, it's just gossip. Um, and one of the things that happens with people is there are lots of people who are bent towards gossip. They like a juicy story. They like to hear what's going on behind the scenes and, and that kind of stuff. And so there are lots of people that are, that are bent towards that. And the reason that I know that is because of practical experience in my life. And on top of that, the fact that the Bible talks about it so much. So there's lots of that going on. Um, I'm not bent towards that. And so I don't have a, a, you know, I've never had a real problem with that. Every once in a while, I've found myself talking about somebody and it almost immediately goes into my head, that guy's not here and we're sitting here talking about him. It's not supposed to be done and so I'll stop it. And that's not something that Jesus necessarily did in me totally because even before I was a Christian, I didn't like that stuff, okay? And so um, what I'm telling you is I understand that there are, are, are different types of people and they're bent in different kinds of ways. So that some of the things that some of the ways that I'm not bent towards is gossip. I'm not bent towards that. I'm not bent towards love and money at all. Never have been, and it's never been a big deal to me. I am bent towards frustration. I want everything to work right the first time, and I don't want to do it five times. And after I get it done, I don't want somebody to come in and wreck it after I got it done because now I got to spend another 15, 20, you know, three hours fixing the thing after I already fixed it and you came along and wrecked it. And so if that happens, you will see frustration from me. Actually, I found out, you know what my, uh, my um, original last name was, was Unruh before I was adopted. So it was Unruh. So I'm, you know, I, I was messing around on the internet not too long ago and I'm looking up what the word Unruh means. You know what it means? Unruly. Yeah, unruly. <laughs> it means rude. <laughs> and I was like, and... If you think I'm gnarly, you should see my, my, my biological dad, man. It was like, wow! <laughs> In any case, you know, um, we're all bent towards certain things. And so if we're going through and talking about some of this stuff... Um, in the areas that I'm bent towards, I pay lots of, lots of attention to Proverbs that speak about don't say things before you should. And so a lot of times, if I'm... If I'm uh, um, if I'm irritated by something, I'll give it a day or two before I ever address it because it irritates me. And um, I'll watch out for that. And so we're going to be talking about stuff here that is pretty intense. And if that's going on in your life, you need to know that God wants that gone. And if you're bent towards it, you need to know that God can change you. And I'm not coming at this from the point of view of, oh, look at you. You know, look at how you are. And that kind of thing. It's just, it's just what scripture says. So, um, again, speaking the truth in, in his heart is a person who is true, not false. They, they, speak, they don't speak one thing and then mean another. Um, I put up on the, on the screen there, professes nothing but what he feels or intends. There are no hollow friendships, no false compliments, no empty professions of respect, love, or friendship. His heart, his mouth, his works are all in unison. There's no hypocrisy, no deceit, and no guile. And what that means, you know, and, and again, when you're looking at this, um, false compliments happen all the time. And they're lies. And that's, again, kind of how I'm built. I don't give false compliments. So I don't want to be rude to people, but if somebody comes up to me and shows me something, and it's crummy, and I think it's crummy, I'm not going to tell them it's crummy. 
but I'm not going to give him a false compliment either. I'll go, oh, all right, look at that. Wow, you spent some time on that. You know, I'll try to find something that I can say that's decent about it, but I'm not going to go, oh, wow, wow, that's really awesome. God must have inspired you in that. I'm, not, I'm never going to go that way. I'm going to be as polite as I can in that situation, but I'm not going to lie to people and give them compliments when they don't deserve them. And right now, what I'm thinking about is other people. Um, there are people who are in positions of authority, positions where they can give you something. And many times the whole issue of a false compliment comes up when you've got a boss who can give you a raise and you start kissing up to the guy. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to do the exact opposite either and have a disrespectful attitude. But, you know, um, I'm not going to go up and give somebody a false compliment just because I can get something off them. And so again, you have that whole thing. You don't have hollow friendships. It's the idea of you're, you're a friend with somebody, and I realize that you can't be friends with everybody and have this intense friendship with them, but when you are, uh, when you know somebody and you're friendly toward them, you, you don't want to be a person who pretends to like somebody, and in reality, you could care less about them. It's not supposed to be that way. And Jesus sits there and looks at us, and he sees what we're doing with the people who are around us. So I'm supposed to be somebody who loves people, and, and I do, and Jesus works that in me. That's a cool thing because it didn't always used to be that way. So we, we become Christians. We become to love, begin to love people, and you just don't do this, this fakey, you know, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know. Just you, you know when somebody is coming up to you and pretending like they like you, and they could, they could actually care less. You know when that's happening, and it's the idea that we never want to be like that. And so we speak the truth in our heart um, at, uh, um, with people who are around us. So your heart, your mouth, your works, they're all one. It all goes together. And so there's no fake, no hypocrisy. And a lot of times hip hypocrisy is um, misdefined. Um, hypocrisy is not um, having a standard and not meeting it. So people will say, oh, you say that you shouldn't do this or that. You, you know, you say that you shouldn't lie and you just told a little white lie I saw you do it that's not hypocrisy that's sin hypocrisy is when you pretend to be something that you're not it was literally a word that was used for actors in ancient Greece and so um, in ancient Greece when actors would do their roles um, have you ever seen those masks on theaters so there's a there's a there's a joyful mask and there's a sad mask had to do with comedy and tragedy and so in, in Greek theater, they had um, roles that were comedic and they had roles that were tragic. And when you were going to do a comedy role, you took that, that mask and you put it over your face and you recited your lines. And you were an actor. You had another face beside the one that you, that you actually had. And then you would put the tragic mask on. A hypocrite is somebody who puts a mask on so that they look like something that they're not. And so no hypocrisy, no deceit. No, no trickiness, no guile, and that's trickiness also. And obviously, um, this needs to be in the areas of everything. And so, you can't be a hypocrite with God. You can't be false with God, because God always knows. But what you want to be is somebody who is absolutely real with him. And so, um, when we approach God, our prayers need to be something that are coming from our heart. And so, if I approach God and say, oh God, I just thank you for this day. It's just such a blessing to be with you and to be following you. Thank you for all the blessings that you brought in my life. And on the, on the inside, I'm like, you know what, God, my family is falling apart. Um, my job is falling apart. And frankly, I don't know what in the world you're doing. What is God hearing? Is he hearing the stuff that's coming out of my lips? Or is he, hear is he hearing the stuff that's on my heart? And what he's hearing is the stuff that's on my heart. And so I might as well say it to him. And I can be, I can be respectful to him, and um, I can do it in a right way, but I need to be saying to God what's on my heart. Because I'm not fooling him, but I can fool myself in a situation like that. And so I just need to be real before God. Obviously, I need to be real before my family. And again, you want to be polite to people and you want to be kind to people, but you need to be real with people. And there's situations that have come up in my family. Actually, most of it's in Bobby's family because, well, no, most of the problems come up in my family. 
<laughs> but there have been issues where, where we've had issues with family and just had to talk with people. And so what we do is we pray over it and we talk about it and we, you know, figure out what, what we're going to say. My wife's usually saying, don't say that, don't do that, you know, and that kind of thing. I'm like, yes, I am. I'm going to do it. I try to figure out a way to do it as nicely as I can, but everybody in our family knows who I am and knows that I'm, I'm a straight shooter and that I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to be nice to people, but I'm going to share it and stuff. And um, so I need to be somebody who is not false. And because I'm not false, what happens is when people are um, in trouble, they come to me. And I'm talking about family right now. And so my nephew got himself into a, a couple of situations that were bad when he was younger. And so guess what he wanted to do? He wanted to come to Uncle Steve's house and we spent a week together. And he, he went out and worked with me in the yard and we talked about stuff and talked about honor and talked about how, how you treat people and, and some of the stuff that, that he was dealing with. My nephew, I'm gold to my nephew. And the, the reason is because he knows that when he talks to me, I'm, I'm going to be loving to him, but I'm going to tell him what's up. It's the same thing with my niece. My niece loves me. And, you know, again, straight shooter with her. And I'm, I'm more um, sensitive to my niece than I would be with my nephew. Same thing with my brother and sister-in-law. There have been times when, when uh, um, they've had problems and that kind of thing. And so guess who they come to talk to? And who they come to talk to is me because, again, I'm somebody who's going to tell them the truth and I'm going to tell it in a loving manner. And that's what every single one of us is supposed to be. You are in your office. You are in your family. You are in your, you know, you have this, this sphere of influence and you need to be the go-to guy when somebody is really having a problem, basically. And the only way that you're going to become that is you're, if, you're somebody, is if you're somebody who's truthful. So in the area of your relationship with God, God you're a straight shooter. In the area of your relationship with your family, also, um, obviously at work, the same kind of thing. And I know that there are um, aspects at work where you got to be careful, especially if you're, you guys are working out in the area and stuff like that, because there's a whole HR nonsense a lot of times that goes on, and you have to be careful of that. But still, you're supposed to be somebody who is a man or woman of truth. And when you're like that, people will, people will come to you, is basically, again, what will happen. And obviously, that's supposed to be happening with your friendships. You know, friendships where I've got somebody who will lie to me, that's not a real friendship. There's something wrong there. Uh, friendships where I've got a situation where people won't be up front with me, that's not a real friendship. There's something wrong there. And if I'm like that with them, it needs to, it needs to stop. It goes on and says, does not backbite. He who does not backbite with his tongue. And the word backbite um, in, in that passage literally means to foot it with your tongue. It's the, the idea of your, your, um, when, when you're footing it, it's the, uh, in, in, the, in the language that was used, it's the idea of you're traipsing around. And sometimes you're even kicking things. And so I'm just running all over the place, kicking things up with my tongue. That's backbiting. Um, the, the issue with, here, with this is that we need to be people who don't slander and people who don't receive slander. And that's the next thing that he's going to be talking about. Um, it's the idea of we treat people with respect. We don't say things that will injure them in their person or their character. And we're never the author of slander. And so some of the stuff that goes on in offices where people are cutting people down behind their backs to gain position and that kind of stuff, is those are things that Christians are never to be involved with. Never to be involved with. And, you know, the last couple of weeks, we've been in passages that have talked about this a lot. And the word for slanderer in the New Testament is literally devil. And so the, the name devil, diabolos in Greek, literally means slanderer. Actually, it's a, it, it means devil, but it's a word that is used for a slanderer. So in ancient, in, in, um, ancient Greece and also in the New Testament times of the church, if you were saying that somebody was a slanderer, you were calling them literally a devil. There you're saying, that guy's a devil. And what you mean by that is that guy's a slanderer. I kind of like that because, <laughs> because it makes it something that you don't want to be at all. If you tell me that I'm a slanderer, I kind of go, slander, you know, I don't know, whatever. But if you tell me I'm a devil, 
It's like, I don't want to be that. And so, again, you have that situation. Um, I have a new favorite commentator, and it's because he's so rowdy. Um, his name's Adam Clark, and um, when I was doing this study, I just went through and, and uh, picked up one of his commentaries and looked at what he had to say about this. And this guy lived in the, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And you'll see what I mean by, by you know, him being rowdy when you look at what it says. And you know, admittedly, what we're talking about is English that's a little bit hard to track. Um, hopefully, you'll get this. This is what he said. The tongue, because of its slanderous conversation is represented in the nervous original as kicking about the character of an absent person, a very common vice and as destructive as it is common. But the man who expects to see God abhors it, means he hates it, and does not backbite with his tongue. The words backbite and bite, backbiter came from the Anglo-Saxon back the back and to bite, duh. <laughs> How it came to be used in the sense it has in our language seems at first unaccountable, but it was intended to convey the treble, that means triple sense of knavishness, cowardness, cowardice, and brutality. And a knave was somebody that was just basically a foolish jerk. That's what, that's what a knave is. You're a knave. It's kind of a cool, na- cool, cool word. Anyway, anyway, knavishness, coward, cowardice, and brutality. He is a knave who would rob you of your good name. He is a coward that would speak of you in your absence Um, what he did not dare to speak to you in your presence. It changed that a little bit, so it's more understandable. And only an ill-conditioned dog would fly at and bite your back when your face was turned. All these three ideas are included in the term, and they all meet in the detractor and the calumniator. A calumniator is somebody who trashes you, basically. Um, His tongue is the tongue of a knave, a coward, and a dog. Such a person, of course, has no right to the privileges of the church militant, and none of his disposition or lifestyle is what he's talking about, can ever see God. That guy's rowdy. (laughs) But basically, that's all true. And again, one of the things that um, we need to keep in mind is is that we're not to be people who do this kind of stuff behind somebody's back. You know, whenever you're talking about a backbiter, usually, like he says in the in, in his commentary, whenever you're talking about somebody who's a backbiter, they will say all kinds of things behind somebody's back that they will never say to their face. And like you said, they're a coward. And so you don't want to be that way. And we can all look at people in our lives, um, in office, you know, usually this is happening in work situations and that kind of thing. And um, many times it's happening in certain types of work situations more than others. I've, I've found that uh, people who are in office jobs and especially government jobs, and I was just talking about HR and all that stuff, if they know that they can get you in trouble and that kind of thing, you have a lot more of this kind of stuff going on. You have the same thing going on in construction. I used to work in construction. I had a, bo- I, I had a boss that would talk about everybody behind their back. And the guy was just ridiculous, you know, and he's, and he's, um, he was in a situation where he's supposed to be following the Lord. And this one time I just got tired of it. And the guy didn't show up to work and he started in on this guy. And um, I'm, I'm sitting there listening to him and I'm like, God, I got to be a good witness to the guy. And I'm an assistant pastor. And what am I going to say to him? But I don't want to hear this anymore. And I'm not, I'm not going to put it up with it anymore. And I'm like, God, I'm about to lose my job here. And so what happened was I, 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 just, I just called him on it and, I, and his, I'm not going to give you his name, but I, I said his name. I said, you know what, dude, every time that, you're, that nobody's around here, you start talking about them behind their back. And you've got all this stuff to say about this guy and you're telling me and you're not telling him. And I go, you know what it makes me think of? I wonder what you say about me behind my back. And then he gets all quiet about the whole thing. And, and he goes, well, fine, then I won't talk to you at all. And I'm like, you don't, need to, you don't need to not talk to me at all, but you do need to stop it. If you're going to follow Jesus, it's not something that you're supposed to be doing. And, you know, from that point on, didn't happen very often. And, um, you know, I kept my job. So God was good to me. It goes on in the passage, and he says, nor does evil to his neighbor. So he doesn't speak evil about his neighbor, and he doesn't do it either. He refuses to harm his neighbor, um, trusts God, and gives people what they're owed. And they're not owed harm. They're owed their due. And so 
You don't backbite with your tongue and you don't do evil to the people who are around you. And again, there's all too many people in our culture who are doing exactly that kind of stuff. We had a, um, a couple who uh, was, uh, had their kid um, come to school at our school and they wanted some changes done. And um, basically, they didn't like one of, the, you know, one of the teachers and they didn't like the way that she did her class and, and that kind of stuff. And so they started complaining to Bobby about it. And um, Bobby said, we're not gonna change that. Um, what, we're, what we're doing is trying to accommodate the, the people who are working here. We're trying to be nice to them and that kind of stuff. Um, we're, we're on top of it. We're watching her, making sure that she's doing her job. And we have literally had no complaints from anybody about her. And then we watched her some more just to make sure that it was happening. And what this lady did was she went out to every website. She went to the school, to the school board. Um, she went to the uh, superintendent of schools and basically told them all the stuff that, that was supposedly going on at Calvary Christian and just basically trashed our school, trashed my wife, trashed the teacher and, and did all this stuff. And she did it just to get, just because she was mad, basically. And she wasn't a believer, and so we were, we were pretty decent with her. And uh, she came in to talk to me, and I, you know, I, I just basically said, you know, she was, she was like, well, we want changes. And I said, you're not going to get changes. It's, it's just not going to happen. And here's why. And I told her again. And I said, and, you know, you need to decide whether or not you want your kid in a school. And she's like, you're going to kick me out? And I'm like, you know what, hon, you can't, you can't take and trash somebody all over the countryside and then demand that they teach your children. So you need to take the stuff down off of Facebook. You need to, you know, and that's all we knew at, the, at that point. And so she took the stuff down off of Facebook and it just didn't end up, end up working out. And so then she got on another web page that had to do with a, with a school and gave a bad report and all this kind of stuff. And what she was trying to do was do evil because she didn't get her way. And again, not, you know, I, I, I think that that's pretty straightforward. I don't, I don't think that, that we do those things, right? Just get at somebody just to get at them. And that, again, is not what is supposed to be happening as believers. If somebody does something evil to you, are you supposed to do evil back to them? Do we know the answer? Yeah, the answer is no. Ever? Yeah, no. No. So it's never supposed to happen. No matter what anybody's done to you, you don't turn around and do evil back to them. That's not the way that it's supposed to go. And so um, you treat people right. Okay. Then it goes on in the passage and it says, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. Now, um, taking up a reproach. Oh, you know what? I didn't give you that whole definition last time. Sorry about that. Um, Taking up a reproach is receiving an accusation against somebody. Um, it's, the, it's the idea of um, you've got a friend and somebody comes up to you and says, did you hear about so-and-so? And, and it's a negative thing that they're talking about. And if you listen to that, what you've done is you've received something from that person. You've taken up a reproach against the person that you're, that you're dealing with at that point. And it's something, again, that is not, to, not supposed to be done as believers. We're going to get into this um, next week on, in the book of Exodus, but I, I thought that this applied really well um, to this passage right, there, right here. This is Exodus 23, 1 through 3 in the New Living Translation. And uh, I did that just to make the English a, bit, a little bit more clear. It says, you must not pass along false rumors. You must not cooperate with evil people by lying on the witness stand. You must not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you are called to testify in a dispute, do not be swayed by the crowd to twist justice and do not slant your testimony in favor of, of a person just because that person is poor. And so when you're talking about taking up a, a, a reproach against somebody, um, it's the idea of uh, somebody has been um, spoken about and spoken about in a negative way and you grab that, you take it, and you receive that whole thing. And usually what you're doing is you're receiving it, um, and you don't even know the facts about it. Okay, so we've had this happen in the political process a number of different times. And so just this last week, you have the anniversary of what happened over in Ferguson, Missouri, right? 
And in Ferguson, Missouri, what you had was a cop who, who um, came up to a couple of guys who were walking down the street, and he asked them to get off the street. Turns out that one of the guys had just ripped off a convenience store down the road. And the cop realized that this was the guy. The guy came over, and there was an altercation between the cop and this guy. The guy literally reached in and started beating the cop up. And the, he was trying to grab for his gun. The cop got off a shot inside the car. The guy backed off and started walking away. The cop got out and told him to stop because now he knows that this guy's a suspect, tells him to stop, and what the guy does is charge him. I'm talking about Michael Brown in Ferguson. He charges him, and he, the cop was already beat up, and what he does is he shoots him. Now, that sounds like a pretty rowdy situation when you're talking about you know, just normal people and, and that kind of thing, and a lot of normal people don't know what it's like to be in a situation like that. But if we, if we took a, a situation, um, let's, let's pick somebody. Jacob, can you stand up real quick? Okay, look at Jacob, and he's, he's a thin guy because he's young. <laughs> right? Now look at me. I'm a big guy. Now if Jacob and I were, were up here, and I'm charging Jacob, and I'm coming after him, you know that, you can sit down now, man. Um, you know that what's going to happen is he's going to get overwhelmed by it. And you got, you got a situation that happened like that. And a cop is allowed to defend himself in those situations. You don't go up against a cop like that. So what ended up happening was crowds gotten involved and there were, there were false stories that were, that were spread about that whole thing. And we got this whole thing that's gone nationwide. Now I'm not saying that it's not ever true. But specifically in that case, we know that the guy had ripped off a store, we know that the guy had attacked the cop, and we know that the guy charged the cop after he'd been told to stop, after, and after he'd beaten the cop up. We know those things. And, but there's this narrative that went all over the country about hands up, don't shoot, right? And it was absolutely false. That's exactly what Exodus 23, 1 through 3 is talking about. You don't take up a narrative that a crowd comes up with because you like the story. You don't do that. Now, there's other situations. There was this guy, what was that, in, Southern, in South Carolina? The guy who, who shot the guy in the back? The cop who shot the guy in the back? Off to jail with you, dude. You know, it's like, you don't, you don't do that kind of thing, and especially a cop isn't supposed to do that. So there's not situations where cops are always the golden guys. Um, but you have a couple of situations in the last couple of years where it's just been a false narrative and it's not something that we're supposed to be involved with ever. It's not supposed to go like that. So just because the crowd's going along with it doesn't mean that I go along with it too. And so I'm always really careful when, uh, when things like that come up. In fact, you haven't heard me comment on that for over a year specifically the Ferguson thing, and the only reason I'm commenting on it now is because the, um, all the information came out in the investigations. And so we know what happened in that situation. And again, there's other situations that may be different, um, but not in that one. And so we need to be careful that we are, we are people who don't receive an accusation against a person unless we know the facts in the situation. Uh, and otherwise, we end up looking pretty dumb. Now, obviously, those are... Those are political situations and those are national situations and, and, and that kind of thing, um, most often when we're dealing with this stuff, we're dealing with one-on-one. -on -one. We're dealing with people who come up to you and say, did you know or have you heard or did you know this about this person? And sometimes they'll couch it in prayer. Oh, we need to pray for this guy because he's committed adultery on his wife. Can you imagine somebody walking up to you and saying that? We need a prayer. I heard about a guy who, got it, who had it happen to him in a prayer meeting at church. We need to pray for so-and-so because he, he just committed adultery on his wife. And the guy sit in the back of the church listening to it, and he hadn't done it. And so, you know, it's like, that's craziness. You don't take up stuff like that and run with it. Um, let's do Adam Clark again because, once again, he's a rowdy guy. <laughs> it says the word cherpa, which we hear translate a reproach, comes from karaf, to strip or make bare, to deprive one of his garments. Hence, karef is the winter. And so you see the, the, the uh, commonality with the, those words. Kerpa, I said cherpa, it's wrong. It's kerpa, karaf, koref. The winter is called that because it strips the fields of their clothing and the trees of their foliage. By this, nature appears to be dishonored and disgraced. So, so in the winter, 
Basically, all the trees lose their garments, so to speak. The application is easy. A man, for instance, of a good character is reported to have done something wrong. The tale is spread, and the slanderers and backbiters carry it about, and thus the man is stripped of his fair character, of his clothing of righteousness, truth, and honesty. And so again, um, specifically in some situations where uh, political entities get involved in those things, you literally have people who have their lives ruined when they didn't do anything wrong. And again, it's not supposed to be happening. He goes on to say, all of that may be false, or the man in an hour of the power of darkness may have been tempted and overcome. He may have been wounded in the cloudy and dark day and deeply mourns his fall before God. Who that has not the heart of a devil would not strive rather to cover than make bare the fault. And basically what he's saying there is, unless you have the heart of a devil, in a situation like that, what you want to do is cover the guy's fault, not declare it to everybody that you can. And then he goes on and he says, those who feed, as the proverb says, like the flies, passing over all a man's whole parts to light upon his wounds, will take up the tail and carry it about. Let me put that in modern English. Those who feed, like the proverb says, like the flies, passing all over every part of a man's body that has no wrong in it, and then lands on top of their wounds and feeds off that, again, will take up the tail and carry it about. And what he's doing is picturing somebody who takes up a, uh, up a reproach against his friend as being somebody who's like a fly, and a fly goes automatically to your wounds. Have you noticed that? You have a scratch on your leg. You know, this happens to me all the time in my yard. I'm out, out, in the, out in the back and I get a scratch on my leg and stuff and flies come along and they don't land on, you know, they don't land on my arms, they don't land on my back, they go right to the wound and that's where they land and they're trying to get stuff off your wound and that's what it's like when you, when you see somebody who has actually fallen into something and you begin to traffic in reporting that, to, you're like a fly is what this guy says. See why I like him? <laughs> such in the course of their diabolic work carry the story of scandal to the righteous man to him who loves his God and his neighbor but what reception does the talebearer get I'm making the English better this way or more modern it says the good man takes it not up he will not bear it it shall not be propagated from him he cannot prevent the detractor from laying it down that's the idea of he can't prevent somebody from saying it to him but it is in his power not to take it up. And thus the progress of the slander may be arrested or stopped. He takes not up a reproach against his neighbor, and the talebearer is probably discouraged from carrying it to another door. Reader, drive the slanderer of your neighbor far away from you, ever remembering that in the law of God, as well as in the law of the land, the receiver is as bad as the thief. And so what's supposed to happen when somebody comes up with a juicy story about somebody, and they come and talk to me, is I go, you know what? Um, that is not my experience with the person and I want to know if that really happened. So let's call him right now. You know, that's what I do to people. And if they go, well, you know, I don't know if I, you know, and they, they start hemming and hawing and I go, okay, tell you what, I don't want to embarrass you right, right now, but you've got a problem with this guy and what you need to do is you need to go talk to him one-on-one. -on -one and tell them what your issue is. And if you don't, I'm going to call, actually, I always say, I'm calling him anyway, and I'm gonna tell him what you said to me. And I'll give, you a, I'll, I'll give you a day or two to get it done, but you need to know that in the next couple of days, I'm gonna be giving that person a call and letting him know what you said. And so what that does is it forces the person to do what Jesus said. If you got a problem with somebody, you go talk to them, you and them alone, and you try to straighten the whole thing out. And then if they won't receive it, then you move on to other things. Um, but what that does as far as a talebearer and somebody who is taking up reproaches against people and that kind of stuff, when they come up to me, it only happens once. I've never had anybody who had that kind of personality doing those kinds of things with me ever come to me a second time because they know that I'm not, I'm not going to listen to it. And that's how you stop gossip, it's how you stop slander, it's how you make things straight. In fact, this happened uh, not too long ago. A guy uh, was uh, talking about, um, um, he had some issues with somebody here, and he was talking about something that another guy in another town had said. It was actually another pastor, and I, I knew the pastor. 
And he said, well, I, I called so-and-so, and I talked to him, and uh, he said this stuff. And so you know what I did? I immediately called that guy. I called him, and I, and, um, and I talked to the guy. And actually, I, I had talked to the guy who had the problem before that point, and he apologized and you know, told me he was wrong and, and stuff like that. And he said, I said, did you, talk to the, did you talk to this pastor, and he said this stuff? And he goes, well, actually, no, I didn't. And so I already got a call into the pastor, and he calls me back, and I said, you know, at that point, I'm like, okay, well, here's what happened. And he was just about to say, I didn't do that. And I had already said, but I found, the guy told me that you didn't do it, and so, you know, everything's cool. And he goes, oh, good, because I was going to tell you, I didn't do that. And um, I said, you know what, whenever I'm in a situation like this and somebody tells me stuff like this, I don't automatically believe it. What I do is I call up to find out if any of it's true. And so that's what I did. And he goes, you know, the, the guy basically goes, good policy. And you know what? It is. It's good policy. You don't take up a reproach against somebody. And so if I, if I hear stuff like that, I'll talk to the person who's telling me the stuff. And then I go find out from the person that's being talked about if any of those things are true. And it just shuts it down. And that's exactly what God wants to do. He goes on in the passage and he says he doesn't do evil to his neighbor nor does he take up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised but he honors those who fear the Lord. So in the area of discernment he's got an integrity too. When it, when it says um, a, a despise or a vile person uh, the word vile there means contemptible or despised. It's literally a word that means nothing, a person who is nothing. And so there, there's kind of this whole thing with, with a contrast between two issues there because up in verse 3 it says he doesn't do evil to his neighbor, but in verse 4 you see people, obviously, who are vile. You've got to make a judgment on this. And so if I'm, if I'm in a situation where I'm not doing evil to people, does that mean that I treat every people like they're golden? And the answer is no, I don't. God doesn't. And so I'm not supposed to do it either. Now, I don't know anything about people's hearts at all, but I do know something about their actions. And so we as Christians, are not, we're not called to judge hearts, but we are called to judge actions. And if you're judging actions, then that makes it um, a pretty simple thing because somebody can tell me about their heart all day long, but if every action that they do is contradictory to that, I actually know where their heart is. If everything that they say is contradictory to that, I actually know where their heart is. Jesus said, of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And if so, so if your mouth is speaking like a snake, doesn't matter how often you tell, tell me how, how kind and warm and fuzzy you are, like a little bunny. You're not a bunny, you're a snake. If you're speaking like a snake. And that's basically the idea behind that. And again, you wanna be somebody who's not judgmental in these things, but um, you, need to, you need to understand that there are people who are around who are not good guys, and you need to be somebody who can stand up in the face of that. Uh, the word vile, again, uh, means contemptible, despised man who is nothing. Um, uh, it's the idea of somebody who is loathsome. Um, there is a story in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 3, um, uh, chapter 3, where I'll, I'll give you what the story is and then we'll look at the verse. Um, there's a guy named Elisha who was a protege of Elijah. So it goes Elijah and then his, his guy Elisha. And they were both prophets and men of God. And Elisha was an awesome guy. And there was a king named Jehoram who was a king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He was the son of Ahab. You've heard the name Ahab before, Ahab and Jezebel. And so Ahab was a, was, was a real um, piece of work. And Jehoram was his son. And he was a piece of work too. And there, there was a situation where the king of Moab had rebelled against the king of Israel, who was Jehoram. He goes down to Judah and gets a guy named Jehoshaphat, who is a good guy. And, Jeho and he says, will you go up with me and fight against the king of Moab? And Jehoshaphat says, basically, my people are like your people. And he got into a relationship that wasn't great. And then they get the king of Edom to come along with them. And they're going along and they're trying to, uh, they're going up towards Moab and they're in a situation where there's a total drought and their, their army is, is flailing basically because they don't have enough water. And so Jehoshaphat says, hey, is there any prophet of God around here? And Jehoram basically goes, well, there's, there's Elisha, but 
And, and Jehoram goes, Elisha is a good guy. Let's go and talk to him. And I'm paraphrasing. Let's go and talk to him. Well, when they come up to Elisha, and this is where the verse comes in, it says, then Elisha said to the king of Israel, and this is Jehoram, the son of Ahab, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. I like that. <laughs> that's, just, that's just awesome. This guy had a set of works that was just horrendous. He defiled the people of God. He defiled the name of God. And Elisha wasn't willing to, he was like, you know what? If, if, it, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even be talking to you, dude. You know? And so basically what he, did, what he did was he told the king of Israel to shut up. I'm not talking to you. And he began talking to Jehoshaphat. Told him how to win the battle at that point. You have another situation in the book of Esther. Um, in um, Esther 3.2. That's a great book to go through and read. Because there's a guy named Mordecai. Who's a godly man. And a guy named Haman. Who's an ungodly man. And Haman ends up trying to kill off all the Jews. Great story. Awesome thing. But it all starts off with um, Mordecai. Was a guy who would not bow before Haman. Because he knew Haman's character. And he refused to do it. So Haman was a government official. He would come in, and because of uh, Mordecai's knowledge of uh, Haman's um, um, character, when everybody else bowed down, Mordecai just stood there and looked at the guy. I love that picture. I love that picture. You can imagine a whole crowd of people. They're all going down to their knee and going down on their face, and Mordecai's just standing there with his hands in the pockets of his robe, if they had pockets. But he's just standing there, just looking at the guy. And um, Haman was outraged by the fact that Mordecai wouldn't bow. And so, again, you know, we're not in a situation where, the, we, where we see people's hearts, but we see fruit. And a man who um, sees a person who's not following the Lord, and especially somebody who, not everybody who's not following the Lord is worthless. But there are a lot of people who are like that. And he refuses basically to bow to him, refuses to honor him. But instead, he honors those who fear the Lord. And that word honor there literally means weighty. And it's the idea of gives weight to. So when I'm dealing with somebody who is doing things that are vile versus somebody who is doing things that are honoring to the Lord, this guy is a lightweight. He's nothing. And this guy who honors the Lord is heavy. And so I'm paying much more attention to him than I am them. Keep this in mind when you're talking to non-believers. Non-believers many, time will come, many times will come up and tell you stories about Christians and say, I know this guy named so-and-so who did thus and such, and he's just nothing but a hypocrite, and so I don't want to follow Jesus because of that guy. Well, I do the same thing. You know, I've, I've lived in places where it was a small town, so Big Bear, California, it was like that. And so I would have guys who said stuff like that to me. And when I first started out, you know, I had the opinion that, you know, lots of Christians do lots of wrong things. And, you know, yeah, there's lots of hypocrites in the church. And so, yeah, the, the story's probably true. And so, yeah, I need to come at it from that position. And so I did that a couple of times until somebody's name got named. And then, you know, I talked to the guy and I, and I approached it from, the, from his point of view. And I said, well, if this guy did this, then, the, you know, sorry, this is how you need to react. And I kind of was on his side at that point. But what I did then was I went and talked to the guy that got mentioned. And then when I went and talked to the guy that got mentioned, guess what? The story wasn't true on any level. And then what happened was I went back to the original guy and I said, dude, I just went and talked to the guy that you told me about. And then the guy got all nervous at that point. So now I know that he was lying through his teeth when he was talking to me. And you know what? Every single situation where I have had where a non-believer has come up to me and named somebody that did something to them that made them not want to follow Jesus, every single time that I checked it out, guess what happened? Yeah, same thing. It didn't go on. And so now, you know, um, and I'm not saying that there's never anybody who's a hypocrite in the church or never somebody who doesn't do something wrong because there are. And we all have feet of clay and we all fall. 
but in almost every um, bit, in every situation that I have ever checked out, the person who was doing the talking about the person who offended them was the person who was in the wrong every single time. And so now what I do when that kind of stuff go, goes on is I'm looking at somebody who's a non-believer now. And this guy has no reason to tell me the truth at all because he doesn't believe the verse that says thou shalt not bear false witness. He doesn't, he doesn't believe that honesty is something that he has to perform because he's going to stand in the sight of God. And so this guy is free to say whatever he wants. On the other hand, many times I'm dealing with a Christian who does believe the passages that say you are not to bear false witness and, and that kind of thing. And they, they, th they want to honor the Lord. And so what I need to do at that point is I give weight. And what I do is I give weight to the person that I know is a believer at that point. And I don't think that I'm always going to be absolutely right in that judgment, but that's where I start. And then I find out what's going on. And again, what we want to be is people who will honor those who fear the Lord. If I know that I'm dealing with somebody who actually loves God and fears him, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt. And so basically what I'm, what, what's going to end up happening is um, if somebody comes up to me and talks to me, you know, this, this kind of stuff happens all the time. I hear, I hear stories about people, and all I know from, from that person is that they've always been kind to me, they've always been righteous to me, they've always been just to me, and that kind of stuff. And then somebody tells me a story about them, and you know how that goes. You kind of want to automatically believe the bad about them. But I, I consciously go, no, that's not going to happen. I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. It's happening in a couple other instances too. And so, um, you know, you just need to, need to keep that in mind. It goes on and says, in, uh, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. And that's the idea of being honest. You keep your word whether it's convenient or not. And that's a person of their word. It used to be uh, uh, the situation in the United States where if you were doing a business deal, you could shake hands on something and it was a done deal. Now it's contract after contract with all kinds of legalese with lawyers involved to make sure that you can't wiggle out of it and, and that kind of stuff. And part of the reason for that is because people get themselves into a situation where they commit themselves in business or they commit themselves in their time and it ends up being a situation where it's not that good for them after the fact. I didn't know it was going to take this much time. I didn't know it was going to take this much money. I didn't know that it was going to affect me in this other area. I didn't know this stuff, and so sorry, can't keep my word to you. No. It's exactly the opposite of that. You keep your word no matter what. So if you commit to doing something, even if it ends up hurting you, you keep your word. This is really good in marriage. When you get married, you make vows. And when you're making the vows, you think it's all butterflies and roses and, and, and sweetness and goodness. And then you get into the middle of a marriage and you find out that it's not all of that. And there, are the, there are times when your wife is irritated and you're, you're, you're ir irritated at her and you get in fights and you, know, you didn't know that you were getting into all this stuff. And so people go, you know, um, we have irreconcilable differences. Well, guess what? So do me and my wife. We've had them for 33 years irreconcilable differences. We got differences all the time. And, but we made vows to each other. We made promises to each other and we keep them. And so in the area of business, there have been situations where I made bids on a project and I underbid it. So when I get into the middle of the project and I realize I'm losing money, I don't go up to the, go up to the guy. I've never gone up to the guy and go and went, can I have some more money? because I contracted for a certain price. And so what I do is I get the job done and I learn from it and I never underbid things again. I just learn from it and move on. And I take the bite at that point. And it's like that, it needs to be like that in your relationship with everyone. So again, with God, you made a commitment to follow Jesus. Is it always gonna be sunshine and roses? No, and Jesus said so. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the word, world. And so your vow to God at that point needs to be something that sticks no matter what happens because you made a promise. And so you keep your word. The same thing with your family. You have vows in your family. 
And so obviously we talked about marriage vows and, and that kind of thing. And way too many people in the United States ditch their marriages and crush their children, crush their families in all kinds of ways because it became inconvenient. And, you know, there, there are biblical ways out of a marriage. God doesn't expect you to stay in a marriage if you have serial adultery and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, when you're, when you're talking about irreconcilable differences or they were mean to me or, or that kind of stuff, those things can be worked out and you need to keep your vows, right? And it's the same thing in the area of work and school. You make a commitment at work and you get yourself into a position where it's not convenient anymore. You do what you said that you were going to do. And if you do that, what happens is you become golden to the boss. And he trusts you at that point. And the same thing with your friendships and in fellowship with, with other people. It goes on and says, does not take advantage of those um, who must borrow. Or excuse me, it, um, it says in the passage, um, he, who, uh, he who does not put out his money at usury. And again, that means you don't take advantage of those who have to borrow. In Exodus 22, 25, it says, if you lend money to any of my people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. Now, again, I, I grew up in poor neighborhoods. You know what they have on all the corners of poor neighborhoods? Places where you can go and cash your, cash your paycheck, okay? Or you can, you can get your pay, you can get a, um, a, a loan on your paycheck before you get it. You know what kind of interest they charge on those things? It's like 20, 25% interest on that kind of stuff. And what they're doing is ripping off the poor. They're putting people, the people who are in a bad position, they're taking more money uh, um, from them. And a lot of times people who are, who, are in a, who are in a bad position financially, there's a reason for it. And a lot of times the reason for it is because they don't make good financial decisions. And so I'm gonna take people who don't make good financial decisions and put them in a place where if they want to cash their paycheck with me, you have to give me 5% interest because you can't pay, cash it at a bank because you don't have the right ID or whatever. And so I'm going to take 5% of your paycheck at that point. Or if you need some money right now, I'm going to, I'm going to take, a, take a loan out on you and you're going to have to pay me 25% later on. And what you're doing is dealing with people who are in a bad position because they, ma they make bad decisions and you are um, ba basically trading off the fact that they're disadvantaged in some area or, on, or another and you're making your money off them. It is not to be done. We don't take advantage of people. And so if I'm in a business deal where somebody is um, going to um, put themselves out on a limb, actually, I have done this with people. You know, just in dealing with church because I deal with, uh, sometimes I'll deal with real estate deals or sometimes I deal with lease deals and, and that kind of stuff. And people will come up and uh, they're leasing uh, from the church and, and that kind of thing. And they'll come up with some kind of idea and I'll go, you know what, that's not going to be advantageous for you. You're going to get yourself in problems if you do that. And I'll just tell them straight up because I'm not interested in the money. You know, it's good to get a return and that kind of stuff, and there's things that are fair, but I don't need to be ripping somebody off to make more money for me or for the, especially for a church. That's crazy. And so, uh, again, you want to be people, we want to be people who are more con concerned about the people who are around us than we are about gain. And, again, keep that in mind. Um, buyer beware should never be the, the, um, the theme phrase of a Christian businessman. It should never be that. Well, you know, it's like you should have you should have done your due diligence before you got into this deal and should have made sure that it was good. Sorry that it didn't work out for you. Um, sorry that I'm coming out on top on this thing and that kind of stuff. That is never the attitude of a Christian businessman. It's not supposed to be like that. It's not supposed to be that way. And again, you know, you can have situations where you're doing the honest thing and you're doing, you're doing something that is uh, the, the way that it is in the trades and that kind of stuff, and it's, and it's biblical and stuff like that. And I've had, had situations where I was a contractor and, and somebody came up to me and said, well, I didn't realize that that wall was going to look like that, and I didn't realize that this was going to go on, and I didn't realize that that was going to go on, I don't really like that tub anymore and, and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'll change it. Give me the money. Because I'm not, I'm not going to change things based on the fact that, you, you know, you have a whim. And what I'll do with people is I'll go through things with them and show them, this is how it's going to look. This is what, it, you know, this is what's going to happen with it. And if I think that there's an iffy thing, I go, I go through it with them. 
But if they come back later on and say, oh, I don't want to like that, I don't like that, I want you to change it, I'm willing to change anything that you want, as long as you pay me and my guys for it at that point. But then on the other hand, if it's a situation where, where uh, well, you know, you know, you're a Christian, you just don't put people in a situation where they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going to happen. And uh, um, you're just honest in, in your business dealings. Um, and then finally, they can't be bought. They can't be bought. Um, and that's the, that's the last part. It says, um, uh, he who does not put out his money to, at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. And in the case of uh, David, he's talking about kings, he's talking about judges, and many times what, what would happen um, is um, people would come up and they would give them money to make a judgment in their favor, okay? And so that still happens, but here's how um, it can happen in a more cultural way with us. You have a lawyer who knows that a poor man is innocent, and he knows that a rich man is guilty, and he takes the rich man's case over the poor man's case because the fee, fee from the rich man is gonna be larger than the fee from the poor man. And the way he justifies that is everybody needs a defense. But what he's done in actuality is he's taken a bribe. This guy can pay more, and so I'm gonna protect him against the guy that I know is innocent. That's taking a bribe. And again, it's not something that a believer is supposed to be doing. Um, you know, taking bribes is not just in the area of money. It's in the area of money. It's in the area of popularity. It's the area of po uh, position. And so people can find themselves in business deals where they know that they're going to get a position if they will take a certain stance in a certain situation because the people who are in power will give you the position if you will do it. You just took a bribe at that point. I want the position, I have to, I have to, um, I have to uh, take and put aside my convictions and so what I'm gonna do is set aside my convictions so I can have the thing that I want. It doesn't matter if it's money and it doesn't matter if it's popularity and it doesn't matter if, if it's a position, it's all a bribe. And so again, what we're supposed to be is people who can't be bribed. You cannot be bought. You cannot be bought by a group of people. You cannot be bought by money. You cannot be bought by anything that anybody can give you. You're gonna be, be something who just lives it and lives it no matter what. And you see guys again like this in the Bible. And so um, Joseph is one, Daniel is one, obviously Jesus is one, John the Baptist couldn't be bought, lost his head over it, but he couldn't be bought. You see, you see that with guys all through scripture, Paul, you see it with Peter. Peter had some, some problems at times, but you see it with Peter. You see it with John. Guys who could not be bought. Women, Deborah in the Bible. And you have uh, Samuel's mom, Hannah. Um, you, have, you have women in the Bible who are women of integrity. And uh, again, um, uh, lived for the Lord and could not be bought. You know, um, it, ends up, it ends up in this passage with, um, he who does these things shall never be moved. And here's the last couple of verses I want to give you. Um, David said in Psalm 61, 4, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. And when he's speaking in this passage of never being moved, it's the idea of I'm abiding in your tabernacle, verse 1, I'm dwelling in your holy hill, and I'll never be moved away from that. Another verse is 1 John 2, 17, and this is, one that applies to us specifically. It says, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And so in all our dealings, whether, whether we're dealing in areas of uh, sexual morality or whether we're dealing in areas of business or whether we're dealing in areas of interpersonal relationships, what we're supposed to be people, be as people who have integrity in all these things. And um, again, we do that because we love the Lord and we want to be pleasing to him. And so... Basic answer to all this, um, uh, in, in the sense of keeping it simple, is I live my life before Jesus. I live my life before Jesus. He's always here. He always sees me. He sees my heart. He sees what I do. And, and he's always like that. And so I just live my life before Jesus, and I do my best to do the things that he calls me to. If I fail at it, then I make apologies. I fix things up and that kind of stuff. But that's how you live. And that's a person of integrity. So we'll end it with that. Let's pray. 
And again, Lord, we thank you um, for your word and for the examples that you give in scripture. I, you know, like we've been talking about, just love Joseph. It's going to be so awesome to meet that guy when we go home to be with you. Jonathan, same thing. Uh, John the Baptist, all these guys who loved you and uh, lived with, with right hearts and uh, a life that, that showed it. And God, we, we just pray that you'd help us to emulate them, to be just like them. Ultimately, Lord Jesus, we want to be like you. And so, um, Lord, as we look at these things in our lives, many times we can, we can be looking at certain things and going, oh, that's me. <laughs> and uh, Lord, we just come before you and we ask you that you would change our hearts and that you would help us to be more like you. We, we just want to serve you with pure hearts and we want to be men and women of integrity. So God, make it so. And uh, we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen.